The third resource that we want to look at today is time. They did a recent study a few years ago in a large metropolitan area of the north where they tried to find out how long it took to get a hamburger, french fries, and a Coke. And they went to three different chains, every store of their hamburger chain, a hundred times each. Now, if there were 20 of those stores in that particular hamburger chain, they went to all 20 stores a hundred times or so. And they put in that same basic order, hamburger, french fries, and a Coke. And you can relate to that because a lot of our players eat that for a lot of their meals. Here's what they found out. One chain averaged three minutes to fill that order. Another chain averaged a minute and a half to fill that order. And a third chain, the one that got the thrill of victory, if you want to call it that, the champion in that city, took only 46 seconds to fill that basic order of a hamburger, french fries, and a Coke. Now, why do I bring that up today? We're talking about softball practice organization. We're talking about time management, coaches. These hamburger chains were trying to get the same task performed, hamburger, french fries, and a Coke. One chain did it about three times as well as another and twice as good as the other one did. They used a, a lesser amount of time to get the same thing accomplished. That's what we're trying to do in practice. We are all created equal in this particular aspect of our life. We each get 24 hours a day. We're all saying we don't have enough time. Well, we all get 24 hours. It's how we use it that counts. We hear people say that it's not how many hours you put in, it's what you put in the hours. And to some degree that's true, but it's one of those things I call a half truth. It is very important what you put into the hours, but you've also got to put in the hours. You as a coach and your players as players must be committed to ample practice time. A lot of times our players think they know something, and they do intellectually or academically, they know how to do something. But they've got to put in enough practice time to be able to do it. We as coaches have got to organize what's being done, of course. We've got to put in enough time and you've got to put it in in the right way. So it's not just how many hours you put in, and it's not just what you put into the hours, it's both. We've got to utilize that time well. Being knowledgeable is not enough. You've got to practice correctly enough time so that you're able to do it. Now let's look at some ways that we can use that practice time better to get more out of it. First of all, you've got a plan. You need a basic practice plan. It doesn't have to be computerized or all neatly typed on a word processor. That helps, maybe. But if you don't have time to do that, you at least need to have a plan for what you're going to do with as much detail as you have time to get into your plan. Have a plan. Know what you're going to do at practice. And have your players know what they're going to do at practice. They need to know so that they're knowing what's going to happen ahead of time. Know what you're going to do. Have a definite plan for practice. Learn to work smart as well as hard. You know, we talk a lot about hard work and we talk about being aggressive and those types of things, and that's very important. You do need to work hard and you do need to be aggressive, but we also need to be intelligent and work smart. Work smart as well as work hard. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, one of the ways that you can work smart as well as hard is let's take a basic drill and base running or fielding ground balls. A lot of times we can shorten the line. Instead of having seven or eight people standing in line while one performs, we can break it down into pairs or lines of only three or four. Instead of 16 people in one line, four lines of four. We've quadrupled the number of repetitions that players get when we do that. And we can accomplish a lot more with shorter lines. We can also shorten distances. And that's an example of smart work as well as hard work. If we want to work on a player running around the base correctly, making the right kind of turn going from home to second or from second to home, stepping on the inside corner with the middle of the foot, we don't have to run all the way from home to second to work on how to step on the base. Now at some time we need to work on how to run all the way from home to second and swing out and these types of things, but if you want to work on just the proper footwork, we can do that from a lesser distance. We don't have to run 120 feet or so to work on how to step on an inside corner. Shorten the distances and you get a lot more done in the same amount of time. Use more equipment. That's the third way to work smart. When players are paired up, throwing before practice, why just have one ball? Have three or four. Then when you have to chase a ball after a bad throw, you're going to get all of them at one time. If a player throws a ball wildly, don't chase it yet. After all of them are out there in the outfield somewhere in a wild area, or maybe the area is not wild, the throw was, then go chase them all at one time. But have a lot of equipment. 
That helps you to work smart. And then you can combine scales at one time. Coaches watch your players. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. You watch a player chase a fly ball. Most of them use only one arm to run with. Their glove side arm is just held out straight in front of them or tucked up. It's being wasted. They're running with only half their motor, basically. Now, if you took the glove off, they'd use both arms to help them run. Why not do base running drills with a glove on? When your players are getting ready to get into a base running drill, make them reach down, get their gloves on, and conduct base running drills with gloves. Now you're working on a defensive skill of how to chase a fly ball and a base running skill at the same time. Combine your drills, combine the skills, and you'll save time and be working more smart. Keep the difference in mind between effective and efficient. Many of our practice sessions are efficient but not effective. We may set up a rundown drill in just the right way, where we organize our people, we've got a lot of repetitions occurring, we do it just right with a lot of equipment and all of these types of things, that's efficient. But it's not effective if your players don't throw and catch well, or if rundowns don't occur very often. You've got to prioritize what you're going to work on. Learn the difference in efficient and effective. Efficient means doing something well, effective means doing the right thing well. Work on what you need to work on not just do something right, do the right things right. Also keep in mind that you can split groups. You don't have to have everybody there at one time. Maybe bring a few players early to practice. You've got some players who are having problems putting the bunt down. So you need to work on bunting with these two girls. Bring them before practice for 20 or 30 minutes and just you and these two girls work on the bunting skill in a pre-practice session. Maybe a post-practice session. You've got some girls who have trouble hitting that inside corner like we talked about. So keep these girls after practice in a small group, these two or three that are having a problem, and work on hitting that inside corner in a post-practice. Maybe just bring your outfielders one day. Everybody doesn't have to come the same day. Bring five girls who are outfielders and work on a drop step. They're having trouble going back on fly balls, back pedaling instead of taking a drop step. So bring these five girls on a particular day alone just those five, not the whole team, but just these five outfielders and work on drop steps in a small group. And coaches keep in mind transition time. Sometimes you do a drill in one area of the field and then you've got to go 250 feet away to do the next thing you want to do. Plan what you're going to do in sequence so that you can stay in the same area for a while and not spend your time just going back and forth from one place to another. If you've only got a minute, an hour and a half to practice, you don't want to spend a lot of time going from one part of the field to the other. You want to organize your skills and your drills so that you're going to be saving on that transition time. And then finally, I'd like for you to explore something that we call something to do when you have nothing to do. This is an example of where you can customize your practice and help players make the most of their time. I got this idea from a coach at UCLA years ago, Sue Inquist, and I want to give her credit for that. Something to do when you have nothing to do. Many times during batting practice, a player may have nothing to do. The pitch has just been thrown, the batter took it or hit it somewhere else, and the shortstop's just standing out there. Well, have her draw a square in the dirt near where she plays at shortstop and work on double play pivots when she has nothing to do. Maybe an outfielder has trouble with a drop step that we talked about earlier. So instead of, or in addition to, the pre or post practice or a group practice, have that outfielder work on a drop step. Have her pretend that every pitch in batting practice or every other pitch or whatever you want to do is hit over her head. And even if the ball is not hit to her area, she works on her drop step. Something to do when you have nothing to do. Give each player you have some of these types of drills. And they can use them during batting practice. They can do them at home. They can do them walking down the hall at school, perhaps in the on deck circle, in practices as they're getting ready to hit in a game before they hit. Something to do when you have nothing to do. Learn to use time to have better practices. It's a very, very extremely important resource. Coaches make the most of it, and you'll have a lot better practices.